Hello, I'm Shrantla Holochak, the founder and CEO of UMA, an Ayurvedic beauty and wellness collection. This is the UMA Elements podcast. Each week, I'll be having a conversation with someone I greatly admire on the topics of Ayurveda, holistic healing, spiritual well-being, and alternative health. By sharing wisdom, together we will unlock a secret that as ancient as they are, Ayurveda and other ancient modalities are as modern and relevant today as ever. Kate O'Donnell is a seasoned Ayurvedic practitioner and acclaimed author, renowned for her expertise in holistic wellness and vibrant living. With a passion for ancient wisdom and modern application, Kate seamlessly blends traditional Ayurvedic principles with contemporary insight to guide individuals towards optimal health and balance. As an author, her insightful writings illuminate the path to wellness, offering practical advice and inspiring narratives that empower readers to embrace a life of vitality and harmony. With a wealth of experience and genuine commitment to wellness, Kate O'Donnell is a trusted guide on the journey to holistic well-being. In this podcast, we explore Kate's journey with Ayurveda and how her practice has evolved over the years. Hi, Kate. It is such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. And I've long been a fan. I've followed you along for many, many years and actually discovered you from uh, a book, I think, four or maybe five years ago, your everyday cooking book, which is such a delight and such a transformational book personally. But I'm excited to have you here, especially because you have a new book coming out. And I'm sure our audiences can't wait to hear more about all that you have to say. So welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Kate, I know you get this question all the time, but please tell us once again, how did you get started on your journey with Ayurveda and how has Ayurveda personally impacted your life? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I've been obsessed with India long before I knew about Ayurveda or even yoga. So it was always wanting to go to India since I was pretty young. And so I landed over in South India when I was 19 and was just traveled around all over the place and got pretty sick (laughs) back then. So that was how I started the Ayurveda. I was doing treatment for various parasitic infections and it really, that kind of medicine, the experience that I had through Ayurveda, which was like a, a very spiritual relationship to the body and to the process of healing that was, it was what I had been looking for, you know, and Fair. That, yeah. And, you know, you're saying um, that you went to India and started traveling on your own at 19. Gosh, I grew up there, but you're a braver man than I, Ganga Din, or something. So, man, that must have been such an incredible experience. And, you know, now without its ups and downs, as you mentioned, uh, uh, but seems like you really took the bull by its horns and experienced everything India had to offer. And hey, you specialize in Ayurvedic cooking, bringing recipes into people's homes for calm, clearer minds or balancing hormones. Uh, What got you started into that niche? And as an Ayurvedic, I know that's not a niche within Ayurveda because food Mm -hmm. is medicine. That's how everything starts. But I would love to hear how you came to be such an expert in Ayurvedic cooking? That was necessity. Uh, You know, I started teaching Ayurveda. This was kind of 20 years after this first time of me being in India. But I, you know, over the years studied in various places and I was teaching yoga. Then I was practicing Ayurveda. So I had clients where I was sort of helping them with their health concerns. And I could see that there was a lot of confusion about food you know, people really, you know, they want to eat the right thing, but they don't have the information on what's the right food for their body. You know, I feel like the way that we tend to get information about food from the media now in general is it's like, oh, you know, 
oils are bad. And then a month later, avocados are the best thing for you. And it's kind of this very general idea that has nothing to do with your body, you know, or where you live. And so I found that aspect of Ayurveda to be really helpful for people to help them personalize how they choose the foods that are healthy for them. And that was what brought me to the cooking was, you know, say I have a client who I'd like them to eat more, uh, let's say plant protein, right? And so I'm like, now we need recipes to help them work with this, these foods. So that was how I started writing cookbooks was simply because um, there's no use telling someone that this food is healthy for them if they don't know how to prepare it and how to integrate it into their, their kitchen flow and their daily diet, you know? That, that makes a ton of sense. And one of the things that um, you underscored about Ayurveda um, is maybe one of the points where I think Ayurveda sort of differs strongly from traditional Western medicine is the rule of the numbers versus the rule of one. And uh, how medicine gets approved uh, is if it works for 80%, it must work for the other 20%. I, and I do think the 20% that stuff doesn't work for in terms of uh, that population that gets left behind, Ayurveda tremendously shines for. And it would for the whole 100% if we sort of personalize to our bodies. And you bring up a, a second thing, which is how you help people um, integrate certain food items or spices in their diet. Now, I know this as someone who's followed Ayurveda for a while, but I'd love to hear from you because within Ayurveda, food it's cooking, what it's cooked with has a profound impact on how your body digests it. Uh, so could you, from that perspective, explain Ayurveda and uh, maybe some salient elements about Ayurvedic food to someone who's just starting out? Yes. The thing about Ayurveda is, is that the science teaches that all imbalances in the body, which can eventually turn into diseases, that they all begin in the digestive tract. So there's a big focus in Ayurvedic medicine on the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, and the process of nutrition in the body. It's, it's so important. And you can eat like the perfect meal that's, you know, your Ayurvedic chef made for your body type, but you're like eating and driving <laughs> you know, stand on the mm -hmm. phone and stressing out while you're eating it. And so your body isn't able to take that food in, you know, and transform it into healthy tissues. So there's so many aspects of digestion that we look at. Some of it has to do with your emotional state when you're eating. You know, so one of the rules that ancient rule is to sit down when you eat, which very Indeed. common sense, right? It's yes. like something we would yes. tell our children to do. <laughs> but but I even find myself like standing at the counter eating, you know, and it's like, no, no, we sit down when we eat because the digestive organs can rest in that state, right? And it allows the digestion to just work on the food and all the muscles are relaxed and the food can kind of move down through the digestive process. So simple things like that are really important. And also you mentioned um, the cooking and spices. Uh, spices are, are a very important part of Ayurveda because all spices have digestive benefits. So depending on the spice, it could be something that say um, warms up the digestive fire. So if you're gonna eat ice cream, you know maybe you have some ginger tea after. So that like sharp quality of the ginger sort of warms and helps the body manage, you know, the qualities of the ice cream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we cook with things like turmeric, you know, which is just, it's an anti-inflammatory, it improves circulation. So it's going to improve also the quality of the food that we eat. Like it's, your body has to transform that into this nutritive precursor, right? That's then absorbed into the bloodstream and builds the tissues of the body. And so the spices that we use, they help to harmonize in the gut so that the food juice that's created, you know, when we, we chew the food and then right. the acids break it up and all that, so that that food juice that literally builds the tissues of the body is of the utmost quality. And so spices, because they help the fires in the belly break things down, 
And also if things are too hot, like some of our listeners might suffer from hyperacidity. Mm -hmm. So then we'd, we'd limit the warming spices and use spices that are you know, calming and relaxing, refreshing for, <laughs> for the stomach instead of heating. You know, things like um, coriander and cilantro, things like fennel seeds are fantastic for hyperacidity. Right. And then once we get through working with spices and the in food, you know, if that's not working, we might take the next step into using herbs, which are just more concentrated. Yep. As someone who has, you know, done a lot of antidotes for eating either too much or the wrong combination, and especially uh, hyperacidity, which is something as pitta dosha, I do struggle with uh, quite a bit. Mm. I am sort of nodding my head along <laughs> pretty vigorously. <laughs> um, and, you know, um, speaking of pitta, our listeners are likely quite familiar with the Ayurvedic concept of different doshas. Uh, which is, which are vata, pitta, kapha. In your perspective, what are some of the important guidelines to follow when it comes to eating, being mindful of the doshas? Um, I don't say your dosha because I know sometimes we can be out of balance and, in another dosha than our primary, but I'd love to hear all of it uh, from your perspective. And if I might tack on how do you, Kate, get started in your journey with um, with an individual you might be working with with some doshic imbalances? Mm. I think the big answer about sort of how do we work with doshas and food, the primary principle in Ayurveda is seasonal eating. So, you know, we, we shift right. what we eat according to whether we're in a rainy season, a dry season, or a winter versus a summer. So we would eat foods that cool the body in the summer, foods that warm the body in the winter, moisturize in the dry weather, right? And remove excess moisture during the, the wet time. And so some people live in climates where there's all sorts of different seasons. Like I live in the Northeast and mm -hmm. US, so we have all the different seasons. But even a person who lives in a place where it seems like similar weather most of the time, there's usually still some variation. I say this because this is like the most often asked question. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And so even if, say, your temperature is changing by like 10 degrees Fahrenheit, at some course during the year that for that person is a big deal. Right. You know, so they would be shifting their diet as we age, we move into a different season of life as well. So we sort of become drier. We move into the Vata time of life as we get older. And that's important. I'm working with a lot of women in perimenopause right now. And this is such an important thing because that's the juncture between the pitta time of life and the vata time of life. So there's a, there's a lot of changes the body undergoes that, that do have to do with dryness. And, you know, so we can introduce more moisture and it's so helpful at that time. So it's similar in like a dry time of year to introduce more moisture through the diet. So people do tend to fixate on sort of eating for your personal dosha, where this general principle of seasonal eating, that's the top of the list for, for Ayurveda traditional Ayurveda, that's like the first thing the books are talking about. And then if we have someone who has an imbalance, right, like, like say yeah. hyperacidity, we've got a pitta type. So there's, too, you know, a little too much fire in, in the constitution. It's aggravated because the person is in a very hot season or they're eating spicy food or stress, you know, it's mm -hmm. also eating. So these kinds of things then can cause imbalances that can make it difficult for a person to just do their daily duties, you know, and show up for life. And that's when we want to start, we need to intervene. So we would, if I, a person comes to me with certain symptoms, I'm, I'm then going to say, well, which dosha is responsible for these symptoms? Right. You know, so if it's something fiery, like acidity, we're saying, oh, that's going to be a pitta story. And then we'll look, I'll, I'll sit back with them and look at their whole, their diet, their lifestyle. And we look for sort of, I call them red flags, you know? Yes. I'm looking for, okay, where's the excess pitta coming from, you know, for in, in this person's life. And it might be in their food. It might be stress levels, you know, it might be travel, you know, so many different things that we consider. And then we just very slowly, very slowly, like one thing at a time, we'll start to shift some of those causative factors. While in the meantime, we can introduce things like 
spices, foods, herbs, different recipes in the kitchen that are going to calm that pitta down. But we can't Mm -hmm. just do that because if the causative factor in a state of dosha imbalance, imbalance, yeah, we got to take that causative factor down. And these things happen slow, like very slowly over time. So it's a gradual um, process where people are changing their diet, but it's not overnight. You know, we, we let it kind of happen in a natural way over time. That makes sense, um, especially because, you know, I think of Ayurveda as uh, such a moderate, accommodating science that is yeah. intuitive and works with the body. So, uh, and again, we sometimes the Western mindset of immediacy uh, introduced into it, I think, it can be orthogonal to how Ayurveda thinks about stuff, but uh, but easy come, easy go, as we know. So some of the changes that Ayurveda helps us make, I know can take time, but are profound and manifest and last a long time. So I think uh, a lot of people drawn to Ayurveda, I like to hope are looking for sort of like that lifelong shift uh, as it were. However, I do get this question a lot and I realize it is subjective. Uh, But with that, in your expert perspective, what is the typical journey of shifts, changes as one starts to take on an Ayurvedic lifestyle? That's a great question. You know, I think the first thing that starts to shift is that we start to pay attention in a different way to how our environment and our foods are affecting us. You know, so if I can say to a person, you know, bananas are very cold and heavy and moist. And so bananas can cause mucus in some people, right? And so bananas are this like mucusy, mucusy food. Mm -hmm. I might explain to someone with a cuppa imbalance that eating bananas all the time (laughs) You know, maybe they're eating too many bananas and I'll be like, oh, you know, bananas can have this effect. I like to explain things. I find like then people are really empowered to to take it on and make the change. And it really is remarkable how some of this stuff starts to feel intuitive once you right. are immersed in that journey. Right, right. Because the person with the banana will start to notice. You know, as the week goes on, they'll mm-hmm. be like grabbing that banana, you know, and then they'll be like, wow, Kate was right. <laughs> you know, there I feel heavy in my stomach or I feel like there's junk in the back of my throat at every time I eat a banana. So we start to notice these, the causative factors that we just kind of weren't aware of before, simply because we've had them pointed out to us. And then it's like you, then it's like you don't, in the banana example, it's like bananas stop looking good to you. Because you're How aware of powerful effect. the body can be. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's, I think, what you say when you're saying shrunk, like it becomes intuitive, right? It's your body is like, I know what that banana is doing. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm less interested in bananas now. Like, can we gravitate towards pomegranate instead? You know, all, all fair things. And it brings up another question that maybe is more personally driven, but I do imagine some of our audience struggles with access and mm-hmm. to what might be in traditional Ayurvedic texts. You know, sometimes when we're sending a blog out with recipes, I'll find myself sort of stymied by the availability, even at Whole Foods, which will have a mm-hmm. broader sets of ingredients. As an expert in Ayurvedic cooking, would love to hear uh, your Uh, thoughts on how to navigate that? Yes. So the reason that we'll choose a certain food in Ayurveda is is because of its effect on the body, right? So say we need bananas, somebody's all dried out. So we want to give them bananas because it will really bring that moisture to the body and they don't live in a climate where there's bananas. So I, so we have to say, okay, what foods grow in your climate that are moist Mm -hmm. and heavy and a little bit slimy? You know, they might be like, oh, you know, I have avocados. Avocados grow here. You know, yeah. I'm like, great. You know, you use it in, in a similar, use it for its same qualities. So whatever is available in a person's environment that has its qualities, right? It's going to yeah. heat you up or it's going to cool you down. It's 
I think the the learning curve there is to begin to understand the qualities of the different foods. And mm-hmm. I feel like that's what I'm trying to do with my books is like talk about the qualities of foods and help people understand that. Because if you know the texture and the feelings of a banana, you'll think, you know, there's got like, oh, that's similar to a sweet potato, you know, or right. things yeah. that's similar to milk. Like there's things that are available that are similar. So I feel like, you know, we run into problems with things like mung beans, you know, I, True. that's, that's... <laughs> my, all my friends are like, how do I make that mung bean recipe? And I send them to the Indian grocery store in town, but it's there. I understand, you know, that there are certain things that are hard to find. You know, maybe a person lives in an area where meats are readily available, but legumes are not. Completely. You know, so they're protein source or they live on a coast. And so they have fish available, you know, so it's like, just about understanding what the qualities of the these foods are, how they act on your body, and then you you work with what's there, you know. That I love makes- that answer. It makes so much sense, and again drives home the idea of intuition and empowerment, uh, right? When it comes to Ayurvedic healing, and you started to touch on your book, which is something I definitely want to talk about because there's such a gold mine and an encyclopedia for anybody starting to immerse themselves into Ayurveda. And what I love about them is, yes, they talk extensively about how to use food to balance and heal your body. So there are recipes and more, but they lay such a wonderful, comprehensive, nuanced, but at the same time, understandable foundation of Ayurvedic principles And it starts to make sense why certain foods or certain activities or certain rituals will uh, change your body or balance your body back or heal your body. And your upcoming book, Everyday Ayurveda for Women's Health, is particularly exciting to me because, A, I have health concerns about myself as a woman, but I also know that dear friends, dear customers broader audiences. Um, This is an area that all of us struggle a fair amount with. And I don't know what the reasons are, whether it's the more the stressful lives we all lead, more pollution in our water, in our food supplies. But I think everyone's having an issue with hormonal imbalance. And it's showing up in many good, many on the spectrum, bad ways of, you know, minor inconvenience to just downright wretchedness. So Mm -hmm. with that, I'd love to get started on some of the things that you talk about in your upcoming book. Yes, it's interesting because Ayurveda doesn't, the texts don't talk about hormones, right? Right. Like hormones were only discovered, what, uh, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. So I mean, they got a lot of it without actually going into the body, but you're uh, 5000 years ago. But yeah, some of the more particular medical discoveries as hormones are not addressed indeed. Right, right. Whereas the balance of hormones that that's seeming to be elusive, for so many women right now, Mm -hmm. Ayurveda does talk about that right all the time right and yoga talks about that all the time and so the way part of what I had to do to create this book was kind of get the language opened up for us to have the conversation of how do we use Ayurveda to balance hormones and I like to explain that hormones they're like messengers in the body that they they go around and they glom onto a receptor and and they make something start happening. Right. It makes so, a ton of sense, you know, like yeah. I think who hasn't experienced a fight or flight response and what's right. driving that. So right. yes. Yeah. Great example. Yeah. So the hormones are their messengers, but who's giving them the message? Right. Like, Mm -hmm. where is that message that they're carrying through the body coming from? And that's what's interesting to me, because that's the ultimate causative factor of the imbalance. And what I see a lot is that it does have to do with stress. 
that cortisol and adrenaline, right. those are say the big two stress hormones, they are being secreted in the body way more often than is healthy for a lot mm -hmm. of us. Yeah. And that then affects the sex hormones like estrogen and progesterone because all hormones exist in a balance with each other, right? So it's like if someone's having a, a problem with, say, estrogen, amounts of estrogen, it's we have to look at the matrix in which that estrogen exists and we'll say, oh, well, the estrogen, the, the precursors for estrogen are being stolen by cortisol, for example, that kind yeah. of thing happening a lot. So all the resources that build stress, hor sex hormones and uh, fertility and juiciness, you know, and like all the sexual fluids, all that lovely stuff, the resources that the body uses to create all that juiciness and all those healthy tissues are kind of being funneled over in the direction of creating the stress hormones. Because of the way that we live our lives, <laughs> you know, because yeah. we do many things or we take on too much, we hold too much, we try to do everything, uh, you know, and we don't necessarily, I think one of the problems is we don't stop to take care of ourselves. You know, women, I think definitely end up taking care of everyone else that happens mm -hmm. a lot. And the other thing I'm looking at that really interests me right now is that I'm not sure we pause enough to really sink into our, our deepest desire and the factor that drives us, you know, to act the way that we do in our daily life. And I, I feel like we very easily become disconnected from that. You know, we become possessed by some uh, idea. Like, for instance, I need to make hundreds of thousands of dollars to send my child to higher education. That's a mm -hmm. stressful proposition, right? <laughs> That has some say that, that again. pushing. Yeah, it has them pushing their body in ways that at some point, some bodies at some stages of life are just going to say no. Like we have to do this in a balanced way. We can't sacrifice everything for that ambition. Although it's a wonderful ambition, and I get how important something like education is, you know, for your children. But we, it's like we have to zoom out and take a larger view of what is what are what's the cost. Yes. To us and, and the know. balance, I think profoundly uh, Ayurvedic is I keep coming back to it because yeah. I think all of us know it, but we forget about it in our micro as well as, you know, macrocosms about where the lines should be drawn in terms right. of personal energy, work, food habits, what you're sacrificing and uh, uh in terms of sort of some of these tactical things one might be able to do, Kate, would you mind sharing one or two freebies that uh, one could explore further in your book in terms of how women can get started in mm. balancing their hormones? Yeah, I love that you asked that question, because when we talk about you know, sing, like getting attuned to our deepest desires, and that can be overwhelming. <laughs> Yes. Right? <laughs> so I am, I am, and I always have been, and you'll see this in all of my work. I'm an advocate for very practical, very simple, like first step, right? Because the thing about how Ayurveda looks at imbalances is when an imbalance starts to happen in a body, it has like, um, it has energy behind it, you know? So it's like, it's like when you um, roll a ball down a hill. You know, mm -hmm. and so the balance is, gets energy from rolling, right? And like moving along in this person's life. So when we change one little thing about the trajectory of that ball, you know, the, in the direction it's rolling, it changes the whole process, right? So we often look at an imbalance and think we need to overhaul our entire life. Everything's wrong. Nothing's working, right? I'm doing it all wrong. Where... In fact, it's the one small thing that we start with that then creates a chain reaction. Gosh, how inspiring, especially to many of us uh, who do get glum when things are going wrong. But uh, absolutely, please tell us more. Yeah, so simple things. Like one of the things I'm a really big fan of uh, is the morning routine. 
I think it is potentially the most important time of day because your ball, when you wake up in the morning, your ball is sitting at the top of the hill. (laughs) That's your life. You're the ball and you're sitting at the top of your hill and you can go in any direction that you please at that time and create whatever kind of energy you want that day. Mm -hmm. And so if we just whack the ball, you know, down the hill and start running around, then that's the kind of energy that we create and it, and that energy builds, you know, as the day goes on, we call that rajas, you know, for those who are familiar. So in the morning, I recommend starting with, and this is something I know your, your followers probably are familiar with the cleaning the tongue. And it always helps to reinforce because every now and then I'm talking to someone and she will go, you know, I have not done that for the last six months. Thank you for reminding me. Yes, yes, yes. You know, so I feel like, you know, we clean the tongue we brush the teeth, maybe we do oil pulling, you know, if, if we're inspired and then we drink some hot water, you know, yeah. it's just sipping hot water. You don't clean the pipes with coffee or with cold things. Right. So you, yeah. you actually detoxify and you get the digestion ready for the new day by just sipping on some hot water after cleaning the, the tongue and the mouth. And it's not just about digestion. It's not just about oral hygiene. It's about starting your day with self-care, you know, starting your day by like connecting with the body and just, you know, yes, it's important to clean the mucus off the tongue so we don't have to digest that. Right. Right. And I think oil pulling is a fantastic practice. I've noticed a huge change in my gums. They were going in a not great direction and now they're completely healthy. Since It really is remarkable how some of these practices and they can, I won't say oil pulling is trivial because, you know, some, some of us balk at the idea of the 10 minute thing. You can mm-hmm. program it in, um, you know, you can do it partly in your shower, partly yeah. while you're prepping your coffee, but totally agree oil pulling is one of those magnificent things that people just marvel at the results it, they do yes they're it, exactly um so i'm a huge fan of that but i didn't do it for years i i was just not i did not want to take the time now i walk around my house you know so i'm getting dressed <laughs> i'm doing my hair i'm doing makeup like all of that is happening while i'm swishing <laughs> that's the time that works for me to do it Right. But I didn't do it for years. It wasn't until the, my my dentist wanted to send me to a gum specialist that, that I was like, scary. oh, I said, no, I said, let's wait one year and let me start oil pulling religiously, you know, and I did. And now I'm completely fine. Like I have no problems. So there are, you know, I think these things definitely motivate us. Um, but what I want to stress here is that doing something like this isn't just about your gums and your teeth. You know, it's actually about if we say hormones are messengers, what's the message? You know, so we, we wake up and we start a new day and the message that we send into the organism, the system that is this body is I care about you. You matter. And I'm going to, I'm going to like treat you well and give you some of these substances that, that make you healthy and give you longevity and beauty, you know, and radiance and all these things that, we carry through life because of how we take care of ourselves. I like the sound of that partnership. And, uh, um, you know, ongoing partnership with one's body. In your book, you also talk about uh, something that stood out to me, women's journeys with their hormones as they course through life. And I thought it was beautiful how you teed that up, that we go through these phases and our hormones change and our needs change. I'd love it if you could share a little bit more about that concept, as well as sort of the Ayurvedic perspective, your perspective on how women chart the course of their lives and what their hormones do alongside. Definitely. Yeah. So as you can imagine, when we hit puberty, Pitta comes in. Mm -hmm. In your childhood, it's the kappa time of life. It's all about growing new tissues. You know, kids are all very (laughs) mucousy. Yes. There's a lot of kappa in the body, Mm -hmm. you know. And with puberty, it's like pitta hits, it comes in, you know. And so 
thing, you know, we get a lot more maybe rash or emotional, you know, there's just a lot more um, volatility, which is all things I understand like with the with the high levels of pitta in my body. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And it's and it's, you know, I think if we look back to that time in our lives, we can think, oh, how like strange that that was and felt and how we had to figure out how to be with yes. this new energy in the body, you know? And so we expect that at puberty, but we don't, I don't know that we expect that or look at perimenopause and menopause in that way. So as we get, as we get into our thirties, let's say scientifically it's around 35. Mm -hmm. The ancient texts would say it started around like 32, a little bit older Interesting. back then, uh, younger back then. Yeah. So the, that's when you, your sex hormones do start to decline, you know, so it can be, maybe, let's say maybe more difficult for some to conceive as we get, you know, into the late thirties and forties. And that's just because naturally the body stops putting as many resources into sex hormones as women get older mm -hmm. and it's natural, yeah, you know, that's supposed to happen <laughs> that way. And so it's this kind of very slow and gradual process that a lot of a lot of women might not notice at all, you know, and, and until you s start having changes in your period. That's what we would call perimenopause, which can be a 10 year that can go on like all through the 40s for some for some women. It's just a few years. And, and there's this this is what I think a lot of women are experiencing as a, a more more drastic kind of perimenopause symptoms. True. And so, you know, we're shifting now from the pitta time of life, which began with puberty, where we've enjoyed, you know, the, say, the ambition and the activity and the responsibility of these decades, where we're harnessing the fire element, you know, to be very active, to raise kids, you know, to have jobs, to do all the things that we do in the world. As that vata time of life comes, with menopause and it's men as well, right? It's like in your starting late forties, fifties, like we're shifting, the body is changing and the body's priorities are changing. So the body is definitely putting less into fertility at that mm -hmm. time. Right. And so those resources then can free up and be you know, used elsewhere. But the problem that I'm seeing is that when we do have these high stress hormones, when we start to see the sex hormones dropping as they should, as they mm -hmm. naturally do, the stress hormones are then they're unopposed. Right. And so the yeah. balance between these, these two like groups of energy, we could say in the body starts to kind of get off. And so we need to, as we get into our late forties, let's say we do need to take care about how we aggravate pitta, how we aggravate vata, like we need a little more care and we do need to um, potentially put a little more time and energy into managing our stress or reducing our stress, you know? And I think that a lot of women in this stage of life will naturally, what I see with my clients is women, they naturally, what they want out of life begins to shift. You know, they don't want to kill it at work as hard. They just aren't that interested. You know, a lot of women, I find them really, what's really interesting is they, it's like they're having a spiritual awakening where they're just you know not interested in all of the like busyness that was the hallmark of the Pitta time of life. And they're looking for more an expansive, creative relationship to the world around them. It's a beautiful thing. I you know? know how natural that sounds. And yeah. Yeah. Like you said, a beautiful way to embrace uh, the profoundness of each period in our life as life is meant to be. Right. Right. And I think one of the main tenets of Ayurveda is that we try to go with the flow of nature. You know, whether right. it's the time of day, whether it's the season or whether it's the season of life. You know, we, ex we accept that our environment is having effects on our body, like that we're always changing. And just in the way that we like change what we eat in, when it's cold out, we can mm -hmm. also shift the diet as we get older. And I think the hallmark of that time is we're seeing a lot of high stress. So we're seeing some Pitta stuff there. And so right. with some women, I have to talk about like, 
things like alcohol, especially at night, red wine, you know, like, you know, it's maybe become something we can't do that every day. Mm -hmm. Maybe like meats, red meats at night, those kind of things. Like they just heat the body up in a way that becomes very uncomfortable. And with some women, it's vata. You know, we really need to look at like they're feeling dry. So we see vaginal dryness. We see the skin changing, the hair changing, you know, and this like irregularity of the bowels, that kind of like dry stool. Like these things are not fun. Nobody wants to live with these things, you know. And so then we might, I might start to get them using more ghee, right? Like how can we get more ghee in your diet? Like can Mm -hmm. we get you to get two teaspoons more per day? And can we make sure you're digesting it? you know, that it is transforming in the body and that it's not just going in as sort of like a heavy fat that's going to sit there. And that's why we'll, again, back to the spices. Yes, and I love that your book covers everything soup to nuts in terms of take this, but do it this way and, you know, underscoring the importance of seasonality and time of day, just like, you know, we've been talking about uh, to ensure that, Everything works vitally together. And, you know, two follow-up questions emerge from um, what you just said. One is natural rhythm of life. And uh, are there things women can and should be doing over and above what you already said? You know, I'm thinking about sort of, I know there are people who follow the moon cycle and Mm -hmm. have aligned their periods with the moon cycle. Are there things like that that you're a big fan of and would recommend, especially with the mindset of practicality in our life um, styles? Yes. Yeah, I love that because the book has it has a whole section on lunar rhythm. It does. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm bringing that in there as you know, I'm a longtime yoga practitioner, so I've I've been aware of of moon's energy in my body and a good place to start, I think for women is just to be start noticing where we are in the moon cycle. Mm -hmm. Like, so just knowing, Oh, the new moon is next week on Thursday, right? The full, like having a moon calendar hanging on your wall, you know, or even like uh, daily planners now will have the phases in them, you know, and then you're just aware because we are, during just in the way that the tides like that the ocean the movements of the ocean change according to the moon right when the moon is full the tides are higher farmers plant around the full moon because it pulls water to the surface right so all that moisture and all that what i call sexy juice (laughs) all the (laughs) sexy juice in the body is like coming to the surface with the full moon And this is not like, it's not mumbo jumbo, you know, it's happening in the soil. It's happening in our seas, you know, so of course it's happening in our body. I know sometimes we forget that we're part of the universe and all things are interconnected, Uh, but please go on. Yeah. So I, I think something we can do is say just a very simple practice for women to know, oh, you know, the full moon's on Wednesday you know, and the new moon is two weeks later. And on a full moon day, we can expect to feel juicier. So in relationships, it can be super helpful to clue in a sexual partner. Uh, like things might not be as sexy around the new moon, right? But full moon, like let's Good have to a think date about. Yeah. You know, yeah, like let's carve out time because that's going to be a lot more exciting. <laughs> you know, creativity is all these, all these like outward things are happening. And then one of my big recommendations for for women is to when the moon is new, when we're in the dark moon is to just take it easy, a little any amount, you know, I'm not saying you you close all the meetings for the day, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But like, you just on that day, do some sort of ritual thing, which could be something like, um, making a tonic with ashwagandha 
you know, or Shatabri, you know, Mm -hmm. something very kind of grounding and supportive for the body. You do that on that day, you know, because you know, there isn't as much of that natural juicy energy in the cosmos for you. Or you just, you know, maybe it's a day where you feel like staying home instead of doing that extra thing in the evening. And if you can, you do. You know, and I, not every month is perfect. I do my best to sort of have these rituals and sometimes I miss it. But every time I hit one, you know, a new moon where I rest or a full moon where I'm like super juicy, I, it's like, I celebrate that, you know. It's worth celebrating. And uh, you touched on two, two herbs that uh, I personally love as well. And in fact, uh, um, I always recall your... Um, Instagram live when I asked about Shatavri, which I love for women's hormones. Mm -hmm. And I personally take when I am home, I do dissolve the powder and I drink it. But when I'm traveling, I tend to favor the capsules because of uh, easier mobility. And uh, something that I hadn't realized, but you called out was the importance of rasa on the tongue. And Mm -hmm. uh, made a lot of sense to me. I'd love for you to share that with uh, our audiences because it is profound in terms of how Ayurveda thinks about the food and the supplements we put in our body. Yes, yeah. Yes, it's like the digestive process begins with the tongue and the taste of the food, you know? So a taste is, it's just our sense our sensory way of connecting to what the qualities of that food are. Like if something is, is hot, fiery, it will taste spicy to us, yes. you know, or something like shatavri will taste sweet because mm-hmm. it's unctuous. And so the body then is alerted. It's like the message, again, back to the messengers, right? So the message is, is sent to the body that this kind of a substance is coming in now. So let's get ready. You know, let's get ready to transmute that into something that we can use. So it's with something like shatavri, especially I feel because shatavri is, uh, it's a precursor. It's a, it's food for our sex hormones, which is why so many women are having great luck using shatavri yes. now, you know, and especially in perimenopause and menopause, because it opposes those stress hormones mm-hmm. and helps the sex hormones stay stronger, you know, and the body build those. So when you taste it on the tongue, it's it connects the consciousness into that process. And it's kind of signaling the digestion, like what, okay, the, like these kinds of nutrient precursors are coming down the pipe. Let's get ready to you know, make some, some estrogen, you know? <laughs> and that's the difference between swallowing something and, and having like a powder with, with a hot water or milk or something. That's definitely stayed with me. And I will say that I'm, you know, doing the taste route of Shatavri much more since I heard you say that uh, than the capsules, which, I, and you also said that, hey, at the end of the day, it does come around to what's the precise term you used? Um, uh, habit, there's a more, there's a better word that as long as it supports your habit, take the ca- Take right. the capsule, right? Uh, but when you can, you know, use um, use the powder version as I do. In fact, I do love um, organic India. I think did you recommend that, or was there another that you recommend? For um, I, no, I like organic India, um, Banyan Botanicals for those Banyan who are Botanicals. US. Yes, that's what yeah. I was I was thinking about. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but any other herbs you you love for? women's bodies, women's health, or spices. I I know that is a clear specialty. Yeah, well, spice is definitely, I think, cardamom. Like Mm -hmm. the the soft and warming spices, they pair nicely with something like shatavri and help the body take that in. The ones that are a little warm and also sweet. So that would be nutmeg, cinnamon, dry ginger powder. Like, so I'll drop those into a cup with shatavri. I got to uh, try that. Yeah. And cardamom is another really good one. And they, again, help the body break down the qualities of, of the shatavri. And we do hear a lot about ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is, is one of those. Ashwagandha is warming where shatavri is cool. And so that's a big. Good to be reminded of that. Yeah, yes, That's a big difference because if a woman is ha- experiencing, say, excessive heat, 
like she's having hot flashes, ashwagandha might make that worse. Makes sense. Right. Where for people who run cold, you know, like our very thin people, you know, that's where ashwagandha can be very helpful because it keeps them warm and really strengthens the deep tissues of the body, especially having an affinity for the bones. So that for women who are looking at concerns with bone density can also be helpful and fantastic. Yeah, it's just good to know about the warming and the and the cooling. So sometimes uh, we might mix together the two. Like Fair. one Ashitavri and one part Ashwagandha. That's a wonderful ton, balanced tonic for, for women that is really helpful with the body um, dealing, coping with physical stresses. Makes you feel stronger. Makes makes a ton of sense. Kit, you've been so generous with your time. I know we could talk for hours or I could, you know, sort of just listen to you for hours. But uh, before we let you go, I would like to, you know, we, we have front row access to mm. one of the people I like to think is one of the more celebrated authors of Ayurveda. So from your own perspective, I'd love uh, to hear what each of your books, quote unquote, specializes in, you know, yeah. chances are people are going to rush and buy all of them. But if someone was to pick one or the other, I'd love to hear what each book covers. Yes, that's important because it's overwhelming. There's I've written four books, you know, so far. So the the first one, the Everyday I like to Ayurveda think of cookbook. it as a treasure trove, but yeah, uh, but yes. I, <laughs> it's a lot uh, to digest in the beginning. So the I often recommend Everyday Ayurveda Cookbook as the starter. And that's like kitchen setup. It introduces you to a lot of the spices that we use most often. There's yes. there's Western as well as Indian style dishes in there. I would say it's like 50, 50, 50. Mm -hmm. So you can learn different ways of incorporating these foods and spices into your life. Um, and it's divided by season. So that way also you're not overwhelmed by like too many recipes. You can just open to the season you're in and start cooking, you know? So in that True. way, it's pretty user friendly. And then the second book is about um, the mind. So it's about Sattva Rajas Tamas, which are known mm -hmm. as the doshas of the mind. And so that one, I find people definitely get a lot of help from that book around um, the nervous system, things like anxiety and depression like a lot of all of us need every phase of our life, you know, yes, 17, yes. 25, 45. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So when we talk about sort of stress management and trying to make shifts in, in, in how we relate to our daily life. I think like that book is very special in that way. And that was called calm, clear mind. Mm -hmm. It's also a cookbook. So it has a hundred recipes that are unique to that book. They're not in any of the other books. And the third book I wrote is the self-care, uh, Everyday Ayurveda Guide to Self-Care. And so that one is where it's, I, I wanted to really dive into how this stuff works, right? And so it's more um, home remedies. So the recipes in that book are for things like the cough and cold, um, metabolic function, there's some beauty, there's some like yeah. homemade, you know, mm -hmm. face masks and products as well. Um, and some of these spices, how we might use the spices medicinally, like say making a tea with them and drinking that alongside meals, things like that. And that one also really goes into seasonal self-care, like why we might use a different oil at a different time of year yeah. for a different body type that's in there. And then the new one coming out is the, um, women's health. So again, it has recipes and, and all that, but I feel like I feel very lucky to have a preview of that. And uh, nice. I am um, voraciously consuming it. It's, uh, it's rich, it's lovely, it's eye opening. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it, where is the best place to get one of your books? I think the best place uh, if for an author, what helps me the most is if somebody goes into their local bookstore and asks for my book. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's the most helpful thing for me. Yes. Mm -hmm. so wherever you live in the world, listeners, you know, if you go into your local bookstore and say, I want one of Kate O'Donnell's books. <laughs> oh, how both quaint and uh, just loveliness inspiring. I yeah. will do that myself. 
And uh, if one of us can't pop into a bookstore, what's the next best thing? I think you could buy it direct from the publisher Shambhala. Mm-hmm. You can, of course, buy it on Amazon. You know, I think Understood. the best way to get a book is the way you'll actually buy it. Exactly. <laughs> and Fair actually enough, have yeah. it, <laughs> which enough. is often Amazon, you know. And just to let people know, we can put this in the show notes, but I've also recorded the introductory chapters on an audio so people can listen Um, because there's a lot of front matter in this book and I want to help people consume it in ways that are convenient and um, and easy to digest. So that's free when people pre-order or buy the book. Um, I'll give you that link. We can put it up that then people can download and listen to the first several chapters of the book as well. Oh, how cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom for your books, for being so generous in uh, both your time today and uh, um, all the time, I would say, because I do follow you along. I do see the rich body of work you put out uh, in educating audiences on Ayurveda. So any last thoughts, Kate, before we let you go? No, I would just remind remind our listeners to keep it simple, you know, and remember that that one little thing that you just that you start doing changes everything eventually. It's it's a good tip to take away and live by. Thanks yeah. again, Kate, for being here. We'll put all the links uh, just below the podcast, and I'll also cover them in my ending note after uh, after this uh, closes. So thank you again, and I'm. Hoping we will chat soon, very soon. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. To learn more about Kate's work, as well as her new book, Everyday Ayurveda for Women's Health, please visit kateodonnell.yoga. That is kateodonnell.yoga. Thank you for listening. As we conclude this episode, we invite you to delve deeper into the world of Ayurveda with Uma. Please subscribe to the Uma Ayurveda podcast to continue this transformative journey with our series of conversations that we hope you'll find enlightening. Visit umaoils.com, that is U-M-A-O-I-L-S.com for an even more immersive experience exploring not only our luxury Ayurveda products, but also an array of inspired wellness insight and lifestyle tips.